Thank you very much. Arisha, next time the short biography, I get tired hearing all those things I have to do. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Uh, I think I will uh, start by putting the ups into upstream. There's lots of people to uh, recognize tonight. Um, our MCs, Arisha and Cass, thank you very much for helping out. John, for the honor song. Thank you for offering to do that for us today. That really made a huge difference to setting the stage properly. Uh, Jesse from 270, Graham, and Mike, who's not here, but from Broadband Institute, who helped out so much in organizing. I'll speak a little louder, pardon me. And I want to thank Michelle and Trevor and Charlie from Strategery Incorporated, or whatever their company is called, but they, they helped plan this event. They, they put a lot into this, as well as, of course, uh, the upstream folks, and in particular, Rachel Molina. Rachel has put in so much work to this. I, I, a special hand for Rachel. This event really owes so much to her. I'm excited to hear from Erica tonight, and of course, our special guest, Mitch. And uh, I'm really sorry, I have to follow uh, Max Feinde's speech, because that was amazing, but there was one really nice thing that I heard in there, which was first term which says to me that there might be a second. How do people feel about that? Okay. So, as Arisha mentioned, I, uh, I'm a doctor at the Westside Clinic on Avenue P. I actually live right here in the neighborhood on Avenue F, so it's really nice to see quite a few folks, quite a few familiar faces from the neighborhood, as well as people who don't get here as often as perhaps they'd like. And uh, my work at, at Westside Clinic is something I enjoy a great deal. It's, uh, it's a real honor to be a physician working in this neighborhood. It's something I enjoy to be able to listen to somebody's health troubles, be able to offer some medication or some advice, or most of the time really just be someone to listen and, and uh, think through things with them. It's rewarding work, but it's also work that is extremely frustrating. Because as I, as I always say, people don't get sick when they come into the clinic. They don't get sick in the hospital. They get sick in their real lives. And the majority of my patients struggle with affordable housing, struggle with being able to afford good food, really live in poverty, and face numerous challenges. And so if really what I'm wanting to do is help them to be healthier, it doesn't make any sense to just treat the symptoms of the lives that they're living, we need to be treating the conditions in which they live. <laughs> and it's that frustration, excuse me, that led me uh, to become involved in politics and uh, to experience more frustration. <laughs> And not, not just the frustration of wishing that 44 more of you had voted. <laughs> mm -hmm. We'll talk about that another time. But really, the frustration of the, the su such a narrow window of things you can talk about in the public. There's we're s the narrow window, the Overton window of what you can actually discuss and be taken seriously that forces us to ignore what's actually possible, what's practically possible, and only focus on a very thin sliver of what's politically possible. What determines that window? What determines what we can actually talk about? It's frames. And oh, we've moved on to the, the next slide. I want to talk a little bit about frames for people who maybe want a refresher on that concept. Max always says that the only thing that matters in the world is economic progress, and that he's got a plan <laughs> for how we achieve economic progress. And when I argue with him, Max, your plan is stupid. <laughs> I've already lost, right? Yeah, because I've accepted that frame. I, I've, I've taken the bait and used his language. We are, are, we're surrounded by bad frames, frames that limit what we're able to talk about. Frames like tax burden and tax relief that make us unable to discuss investing in what we really need as a society. Frames like believing that economic progress is the only thing that matters. And the slide behind me, I think, demonstrates one of the impacts of that particular frame. The top line is growth in the economy in Canada. So over the last 30 years, massive growth in our GDP, 30%. The bottom line is the Canadian Index of Wellbeing, which is a basket of 
economic, social, democratic, environmental, education, a number of other factors that give us a numerical value for just how we're doing as a society. And you can see how little that has improved in comparison to the economic growth. Wealth is being generated in this country, but well-being isn't. And if you're looking at that through the frame of economic progress is the most important thing, well, then that's perhaps a nagging bit of conscious conscience, uh, mostly just an externality. Now why do we care? That's not what we're focused on. But why isn't it what we're focused on? Shouldn't our public decisions, our collective choices be all about improving our health and well-being? Shouldn't we be using economic growth to translate into better lives? So that's just an example of a bad frame. And what I'm suggesting is that we need a new frame. I think Mitch is going to talk to us tonight about theory of change. We, we discussed that quite a bit uh, during our afternoon session with him and Upstream. The theory of Upstream is that we need to move beyond complaining about the bad frames that we currently experience and start proposing and propagating a better frame. And I think the best way for me to introduce you to what we think is a better frame is through a short video. You're standing on the edge of a river. All of a sudden, a flailing, drowning child comes floating by. Without thinking, you dive in, grab the child, and swim to shore. Before you can recover, another child comes floating by. So you dive in and rescue her as well. Then another child drifts into sight. And another, and another. Eventually, hopefully, some wise person will ask, who keeps chucking these kids in the river? And they'll head upstream to find out. Every time we have to clean up an environmental disaster, every time a young person winds up in jail, every time people have to take medications to make up for the fact that they couldn't afford good food, we're suffering from the results of downstream thinking. Thinking upstream means making smarter decisions about what kind of country we want. What better goal could Canada have than creating the conditions for all people to enjoy true health and experience physical, mental, and social well-being? It's the best way to measure our success. And upstream thinking is the way we get there. Help us make the mainstream look upstream. Visit us at thinkupstream.net to find out more. So that... <laughs> That parable of the river is really sort of the, the founding myth of upstream. It's the story behind the way we're looking at, at public decisions. But the goal of all of that is to try and change our focus towards really achieving optimal health for Canadians. And the list that you see in front of you is the social determinants of health. These are the factors that make the biggest difference. As you see, health services, 10th on the list. What we usually focus on, doctors and nurses and hospitals and pharmacists, when we talk about health, really isn't what has the biggest impact. It's how much money you make, what level of schooling you've been able to achieve, where you live, whether the environment around you is clean, what you're able to afford to eat, what kind of work you have. And this, to me, is, if you will, the, the science behind our theory of change. This, uh, this is well supported by studies, and it gives us a couple of things. It gives us a guide for action. If we're wanting to achieve optimal health, these are the things we need to address. Fortunately, they're also the stuff of politics and social policy. We can address these things. These are what we can affect through our public decisions. It also, by focusing on health, gives us a way to measure whether or not we're being successful. We measure health outcomes, morbidity, mortality, the impact of different illnesses. We can now measure the impact of a policy decision right down to the level of an individual. And that opens up an opportunity to move from political decisions that are made on ideology, on best guesses, on what seems popular in the polls, to evidence-based policy. And that, to me, is at the heart of smart change, to be able to make our decisions based on the best knowledge available. So how do we actually try and make that change happen? Well, what we've done in recent months is establish upstream. And Upstream is a national nonpartisan organization dedicated to proposing and, and propagating this frame. And it really does reflect 
when I first wrote this slide, I was, uh, when we first had this sentence as our description, felt a little bit of trepidation about referring to it as a movement. But the more I've been traveling across the country, the more I've been seeing, you know, see the lineup that we saw outside tonight, the more I recognize that this is a movement. We're naming it and framing it, but this is happening. People want uh, this kind of thinking. There's a real appetite for it. So that's what we believe, but what do we actually do? If you look at the uh, three boats or pieces of colored macaroni or whatever it is that's in our logo, uh, those really represent three areas of our work. One is a think tank, working with advocates and academics to really gather the evidence of what we know can be done to impact the determinants of health and focusing towards the best actions. The second one is the, the story shop, because it's not enough to just put the statistics out there. If we are only approaching people's heads and not touching their hearts, no one's going to listen to what we have to say. So working with various artists as well as various host voices to, to approach different groups so that we can really bring forward these ideas in a way that people can understand and connect to so that we can build the third boat, which is community, a group of people who are thinking along these lines that can quickly respond to new campaigns or be consistently involved with pushing forward this way of thinking. To put that a little bit more in context in terms of the, a campaign we're actually doing and, and some work we are just about to launch, this actually is going to start March the 10th here in Saskatoon as a partnership between the Saskatoon Poverty Reduction Partnership, the Anti-Poverty Saskatoon, and Food Bank, as well as working with Unite Co-op and Upstream, of course. This is a campaign about just how much poverty costs us in Saskatchewan. And we start with the evidence. We start with the facts. We crunch the numbers. Poverty is costing us nearly $4 billion a year, 5% of our GDP. About two-thirds of that is through missed opportunities, decreased productivity of the e economy, decreased revenue. The rest is through increased health costs, increased justice, and social service costs. It's about $4,000 $4, each a year that we're wasting. If we took even the most expensive way of addressing poverty, a basic income guarantee, and there, there are other ways and less expensive ways, but even if we took that one, it'd only be a billion dollars a year. So we're spending four times as much to leave people suffering in poverty than we would to alleviate that poverty. So we're taking those facts, bringing them forward, but bringing them forward with feelings connected, connecting them to stories and real stories working with essential voice people, recognizing that when we talk about poverty, it has to be nothing about us without us, that we need to hear those primary voices. And so we're sharing stories like Olivia, who needed glasses, and rather than being able to afford glasses with benefits, her mom actually had to quit her job and go back on social assistance, because that was the only way that she could actually afford the glasses. Or Dylan, who got caught stealing a toque because he needed one for a school trip, but didn't think his family afford, could afford it because his dad had been missing shifts at work because of an injury and didn't have the supports to maintain his income during the time that he was hurt. Those stories bring forward the human cost to connect to the economic cost. But it's all with a focus. It's all moving towards demanding of the provincial government, because it's only us in BC that doesn't have one, a comprehensive poverty reduction plan with targets and timelines and accountability so that we actually deal with this problem, so that we don't just hope it goes away. We actually focus and have a plan to reduce and remove poverty from people's lives. So we're through that campaign, I think we're touching people's heads, their hearts, and hopefully bringing their hands forward to take action. Now, Things aren't going to change. The f this new frame isn't going to remove all of those bad frames in one campaign. It's a matter of rinse, repeat, refine, rinse, repeat, refine. Uh, a stream doesn't change a landscape overnight, and neither will upstream change the political landscape overnight. But we'll keep at it, because we truly believe that this focus on health and this way of talking about upstream thinking to address the social determinants of health is something that appeals it appeals through different classes, appeals through different political viewpoints, appeals at all different ages. This is something everybody can get behind because we all care about our own health and the health of those around us. And I think that 
gives us an opportunity to move toward that stage where we're going to hear about upstream thinking and the determinants of health from parties across the spectrum because folks like you are going to be de demanding of them. How is what you're proposing going to improve our health? And that is how we move towards a truly healthy society. Thanks again for joining us tonight. Have a great night.